Welcome to Manifest. Here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. For the next few moments, I'm going to be sharing with you a subject that's very important called, Will the Church Go Through the Tribulation? And if you know anything about the tribulation, it's believed to be seven years in length, divided up by 42 months and 42 months. However, there is a big controversy on when the coming of the Lord for the church and the resurrection of the dead in Christ will take place. So basically, here's what I want to ask you. Is the church, the ecclesia, the overcoming church, the believers who are truly saved, have a relationship with the Lord whose names are in the Lamb's book of life, are those individuals going to be on earth during portions of the tribulation? Let's just stick with one theory. Let's not stick with mid-trib. Let's just go to post-trib. Are we going to be here through the entire seven years, or are we going to be in heaven for about three and a half years, or are we going to be in heaven for the entire seven years? Now, to understand a little bit more about this, we have to establish one important fact. Is the book of Revelation in a chronological order? And the answer is yes. In order to make it a post-trib issue, you have to throw certain chapters at other places than where the chapters are, if that makes sense. Now, let me explain it to you this way. If you look for example, in chapter 1, it's Jesus the high priest. Chapters 2 and 3 is the messages to the seven churches of Asia. Chapter 4, it says, After this, I heard a voice like a trumpet saying, Come up hither, and immediately I was in the throne room. Chapter 4 through chapter 19 deals with what we call the events in the tribulation. In other words, the Old Testament prophets saw the great day of the Lord, the day of God's vengeance, the day of God's wrath, and what John in Revelation saw was how it all culminates and comes together in a set period of time. And so this is why you have the seven trumpets of the angels, the seven vials, the seven bowls. You see all of these different judgments that are being released during this time, which will occur again during the seven years. Now, the first part in Revelation 16, 17 is called the wrath of the Lamb, but the latter half, Revelation 14, verse 10, is called the wrath of God. And the wrath of God was known by the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah 13 talks about how the earth would be shaken, the constellations would fall. Joel, uh, Joel talks about that, the blood, the fire, the pillars of smoke, and all these things that are going to happen in the, in, in the judgment of God area. Thus, here's what you have in the book of Revelation. You have John viewing events happening on the earth. Then you see John saying in chapter 9, I saw the abyss, the bottomless pit open, and these really weird looking creatures came out of the pit. He's looking under the earth, he's looking on the earth, and then he's also looking in the cosmic heavens, which are the heavens where the sun, moon, and stars are, and he goes even beyond that into the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, where paradise is, where God is. So John is seeing four views, under the earth, on the earth, the cosmic heaven, and what is above the cosmic heaven, and that's where God dwells. So he's actually seeing four different dimensions at one time in his vision. So I will go back to the original uh, 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 question that I was saying to you, and that is this. Is the book of Revelation in a chronological order? And I can say, yes, it is. And here's the reason why. He says, after this, two times in the book, he says, after these things, three times, and he talks about, and after, three times. Now, if I say this, now, we're preaching now, but after the service, we're going to eat. That's a chronological order. That means I do this first, then I get to that. So John's references or phrases of and after or after this is indicating there is an order to this. There is a progressive order to this during this entire time frame. So in other words, we have to establish the fact that the events of Revelation come in a chronological order. Now, we come to a very important question, and that is this. When do the saints arrive in heaven? We can go to chapter 5 and chapter 6, but we go to chapter 5 where Jesus is breaking the seven-sealed book and the seven-sealed will. And it says that no man was worthy to open the book anywhere in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. Now, the seven-sealed book is interesting because I went to the Israeli Museum, and I saw something that thrilled me. 
in, in this glass showcase was the, a actual will that had been made in the Roman time that had originally had leather straps on it with seven seals. The, the, the will had been broken open, but the seals had been discovered in the excavation. Now, if you had been a rich man, because Caesar Augustus' will had seven seals on it. So a seven sealed book was not weird when John wrote about it of Jesus having a seven sealed book in heaven. However, if you were to be a rich man and you were to have a will signed and you wanted to roll it up and save it for the day you died to be opened, everybody had a signal ring. Now this has a beautiful star of David on it. And what you would do is you would put the, uh, tie the tie, uh, you would get your seven, family members, seven friends, seven people that were witnesses. You had to have seven witnesses. You tie it with leather, you put wax on it, and you take that insignia ring, the signal ring, and you hit it. And seven different people did that. Now here's the catch. When that person died and that will was to be opened, if this was the will of a wealthy person, you had to have the seven witnesses, or if they had died, their son that had the ring of the family. How many of you know the prodigal son got the father's ring? Come on, somebody. Every father had one handed down. You had to have them present, and when you matched that first seal, it was broken. You matched the second one, it was broken. And you broke all seven of them to read the will of a very wealthy person. Can I tell you that that's why there are seven churches in Revelation and not eight, 10, or 12. That's why there's seven pastors in the book of Revelation, not eight, 10, or 12, because every pastor must be present to, as a witness when that will is broken because Jesus addressed the entire book to seven churches. So the entire book, y'all, did y'all just get what I said? The entire book is addressed to the seven churches. So that pastor has to be there when the first one's broken, the second one's broken, the third one's broken, the fourth one's broken. Now, stop right there. If the pastors of those churches that have been dead a long time have to be present in heaven at the breaking of the will, I'll let you guess when the dead in Christ have risen. Not in Revelation 19, not in Matthew chapter 24. The dead in Christ have risen, and when John said, I heard a voice like a trumpet saying, come up hither, and immediately I was in the throne of God and in the spirit that day. So that's when this takes place. Now, that brings me to something very important. There's worship in heaven in chapter five and they're singing, worthy is the lamb that has redeemed us out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's in chapter five. But let's move forward as he starts talking about the judgments to chapter 11 because something is happening in chapter 11. This is the evidence to me that you cannot have post if I had only this verse. This is the evidence to me. Here's what happens according to the Bible. There are four types of judgments. Number one, there's the judgments of the tribulation written in the book of Revelation. Number two, there is a judgment of the nations in Joel 2. I'll talk about that later, where the nations are judged in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Number three, there is a great white throne judgment, which happens, at the in, uh, in, uh, which happens in heaven at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ. That's where all the sinners, the demons, the devil, Satan, that's where they all stand before God at that judgment. But there is another one, and we're not giving the order here, but this is the one we're talking about. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's also known as the Bema. And this is the judgment where people will receive rewards for the good that they did, or they will be judged what for the works they did in their body. Now, let me give you the scripture on this. And this is number two, guys, if you'll follow me. It says this, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, unto the saints, well, hello, there you are, believers, unto them that fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy them who are destroying the earth. Now, this judgment in Revelation 11 is the judgment of rewards. It's very clear here. Now, let's look at two other places where this is mentioned in the New Testament. Romans chapter 14, 9 through 12. Um, For to this sin Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and this in Greek is the bima, the bima, so that each of us shall give an account to God and to God for himself, or for himself to God. Second Corinthians chapter five, nine through 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, 
whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive of the things done in his body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Now notice, it's the judgment seat of Christ, but we stand before God. Where does God dwell? He dwells on a throne in heaven, in the heavenly temple. This judgment happens in the heavenly temple because we must stand before God. Now, the rewards are not going to be given on earth at the end of the tribulation when Jesus judges the nations. See, people get this judgment of the nations concern, uh, confused with the bema, which is the judgment of the believer, the judgment of the saints of God. They get them confused. But rewards are going to be given in heaven. Revelation 18, 11, and the dead are judged. Now, how can the dead be judged? They have to be resurrected. In order for them to be judged, they have to be raised. There's been a resurrection, obviously. But watch this. We are going to be resurrected into an incorruptible body, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 53, and we will receive an incorruptible crown, and that means a crown that perishes not away, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Okay, let's look at three verses right here. Here we go. This is what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, whom the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, but not to me only, but to all who also, watch, love his appearing. Now, if he'd have left part B out, he would have said it this way. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, whom God, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But notice why you get it because you loved his appearing. How did you get to this judgment? Because he appeared. And you loved the fact that he appeared. And because you loved his appearing, you have a special reward. First Peter chapter four and verse five. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge, watch this, the quick and the dead. Two people. The quick is the Greek word for alive or living. Those who are living, will be judged at the same time those who were dead. There has to be a resurrection of the dead for the dead to be judged with the living because Paul put them together in one event. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul put together the living and the dead that would be raised and how they would meet the Lord together. First Peter five and, two, five and four says it this way, when, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. He appears, we love his appearing, we stand before God at the judgment, which is called the judgment seat of Christ, which is called the Bema, and you receive five different kinds of crowns if you're worthy of those. You receive a white stone, you receive a new name. This is all in Revelation chapter two and chapter three. So there are blessings for serving the Lord, and there are blessings for being faithful, and I think the amen and the praise God goes right there if somebody would help me for just a little bit. Hallelujah. Okay, now, what would a post-tribulation person who believes in post-trib believe about the Bema? Well, if we're not going to be in heaven at all during the seven years, and we're going to just go up and do a U-turn and come back, that means the Bema would have to happen on the earth and not in heaven. Now, someone says, well, where do they get that uh, idea from? Because there's scriptures that says when the Lord, now watch this, when the Lord returns, his reward is with him. So that is interpreted that Jesus, I'm going to say it this way, Jesus is coming back on a white horse with the 250 million white horses behind him carrying crowns. Because I'm. let's face it, if you're going to judge million, tens of millions of people and you're going to have all these crowns, somebody's going to have to get them out of heaven and transport them there so you can have a judgment. Am I being facetious? A little bit. A little bit. Now, this is important. It says his reward is with him, not our reward is with him. Watch the wording. 
our reward being with him would mean he is coming back, there'll be a judgment, and we're going to get rewarded when he comes back to earth. His reward, what did Paul say his reward was? Paul's reward was the salvation of the people and the fruit that he'd experienced through the preaching of the gospel, and they were his reward. What is Jesus' reward? His reward is with him. We are his reward. We are saved by the blood. Hallelujah. We are part of his army. And he brings with him, as he gets ready to take control of the earth, he brings his reward. <laughs> Woo, listen to this. Here we go. Luke 6, 23. Read, uh, the disciples were all excited because they could cast out devils. Jesus said this. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. He's talking about being persecuted now for righteousness sake. For your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did they also persecute the fathers unto his prophet. Uh, in like manner did the, fathers, uh, did the fathers unto the prophets. That's Luke 6, 23. Now, he says this. If you can endure persecution, you will have a great reward in Well, where is it going to happen if it's in heaven? It happens in Revelation 11. It happens at the Bema. It specifically uses the same word. And now has come time to reward the saints, and those who fear the name of the Lord and the prophets. James 1 and 2 says, if you endure temptation now, testing now, you will receive a crown woo, that the Lord has promised. Mm -mm -mm. Now, maybe I'm saying this a little too practical, but when you read the book of Revelation, you will read that in, in the tribulation, the city of Jerusalem has an earthquake that a big portion of the city collapses and 7,000 people are killed. When Jesus comes back, the Mount of Olives splits in the middle, one part to the east, one part to the west, and a great valley comes through. So if Jesus is going to take the millions and millions and millions of believers and judge them on earth, he's going to have to clean that city up for a few years before he gets it ready for that. Does that make sense to anybody? Because our, our oh, I could go on. Oh, help me, Lord. Okay. Okay, let me say it this way. Let me just give you another one, and maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself, and if I am, I am. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, prepare. I go, I go, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again. And here we go. Receive you unto myself. Don't put the period there that where I am, there you may be also. He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's ever living to make intercession. He'll take a seven-sealed book from the hand of the Father one day. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the Bible makes it very clear that we have to have a trip to heaven. We're not going to do a U-turn, come back and rule for a thousand years, then renovate the earth and come back and live on the earth in the new Jerusalem. He made heaven for us to visit, to look at, to enjoy, and to hang out for a little bit. I've got a heavenly trip planned.